At the end of two weeks in Badger Section at San Quentin, I was starting to feel pretty overwhelmed. My acquaintance Mike had told the shot caller he wasn't going to bring out his paperwork, and there was only six days left on that ticking clock. And Ty, my co-defendant, had arrived, and as happy as I was to see him, he had informed on me to the police. He had lied regarding my involvement in the case, and it went to court. Not only was this personally a big issue, but this is the type of behavior that does not fly on an active yard. He was a rat, and there was going to be problems. And then finally, my counselor had said that I was going to have to wait three months in Badger Section before being transferred to a crappy prison. At this point, I didn't even much care what prison I was sent to because I knew that it was going to be high security. It was going to be dangerous. He'd made that clear. I just knew I didn't want to wait there in Badger Section for three months for the transfer because things were chaotic and they were getting out of hand quickly. I could tell it was someplace I didn't want to spend a lot of time. The doors were closed. There was no more movement, so I couldn't do anything for my Gertai. So I sat down with my Title 15, which is the rule book that they issue to all inmates about how the rules in prison work. It can be difficult to read. It's written in legalese, even though it's only about 200 pages long. Most inmates don't read it. They just use it in a weight bag or throw it away. I am very literate. I'm comfortable with legalese, so I was able to go through this thing slowly. And I did find something which was so valuable to me. There's a policy in CDC. If a decision is being made that affects you by a committee, you have the option of having letters sent in and your counselor will read them and present them to the committee. This is a big deal because it means that it wasn't just going to be my statement that would have to be considered. I didn't want to go to a bad prison. Well, pretty much everybody says that. They could also take the statement of my wife, or my mother, or my father. They could have a dozen letters that they'd have to read saying that I was a decent guy and that they should take the extra 30 seconds with my case. This was a great opportunity for me. So I broke out the paper and stamps that I had set aside, and I wrote my wife and explained the situation. I gave her the counselor's name and explained that we needed letters sent to him telling him to get me out of San Quentin and to get me to a good prison. Dropped it in the mail that night and kind of just settled in with the silence and the bars and waited for morning. It's really wearing being alone that long, not having a Sally. Two days later, at Yard, I got to spend some time with Ty. I went out there, and Sam was already giving him the mandatories, and it was all very familiar. Mandatory Yard, mandatory program, mandatory workout, and good for Ty. He knew the right places to say, yes, sir, and I'll do that, and don't worry, I understand, and it was over pretty quick, and I went over and shook his hand. Uh, he started by apologizing uh, about the thing where he told the cops that I was a murderer. I was very upset about this. It had been part of the series of events that ruined my life. But I understood that he'd been trying to protect himself, and I told him that I understand that whenever you're faced with something like the death penalty, life without parole, prison, you do desperate things that you regret later. He was grateful that I understood, and he made clear that he intended to take back his statement, that he wanted to contact the court and say that it had all been lies, but that because he was serving a sentence of life without parole, he wanted to be really cautious that he didn't hurt his uh, appeal chances. I was pretty sympathetic to that. You would think that I'd want to, you'd think I'd want to kill this guy, honestly. He lied and had me sent to prison. But that said, I know he's an innocent man serving a sentence of life without parole. That's kind of the harshest sentence I can imagine being given to an innocent person. So it's hard for me to hate him, regardless of what else happened. As we were talking, Irish walked up, and he put a hand on Ty's shoulder. And it was one of those hands where you know it's not coming right off. This wasn't a polite pat. This was him gaining control of Ty. And he leaned in and it felt like violence was imminent. He said to Ty, hey, 
Shotgun Steve over there says he saw you on the SNY side of the Mendocino County Jail. You're a rat. You got anything to say about that? The situation was incredibly tense. It was just the three of us, and I sincerely think that Irish was just about a second away from breaking Ty's nose for him, or maybe worse, he could have been armed for all I know. But I jumped in, and I said, actually, I, I know this guy. He's my co-defendant. He talked to the police about me. And Irish thought for a second. He said, he ratted on you? And I said, absolutely. He, he gave a statement to the cops saying that I killed the victim in my case, and I didn't. He's... Irish thought about it and said, look, i, I got to talk to Sam. I don't know what the hell's going on here. And he walked off. I guess the crisis had been averted. The two of them walked back. And Sam asked me, he said, Aaron, you know this guy? I said, absolutely, he's my co-defendant. I, I went to court with him. He said, is he a rat? Was he PC? And Ty was on the SNY side of the jail, and I can't lie about that. I told him, yeah, absolutely, he was on the SNY side of the jail. I know I saw him there at least one time, and I think he was there for at least three days. But I'm the guy he told on, and he didn't realize where he was, and he left there after three days, so I think he should get a chance to pitch his case. Sam acquiesced. He said, okay, I tell you what, we're all going to talk about this at breakfast tomorrow, and we're going to figure out exactly what's going on, because I can't have a rat on my yard. I don't care about anything else. They recalled the yard, and we all went home. I, I guess that was it for the day, but there were a couple of uh, shoes waiting to drop. Mike was about six days from getting stabbed, and I think Ty had been about six seconds from getting stabbed before I jumped in. I don't know where things were going next at this point. I went home, locked my door, and again, I got ready to settle in with that silence, those hours between whenever they lock up after dinner and whenever they open up for breakfast. It's about 12 hours long, and it's quiet, and it wears on you. I can't express it enough the silence, the loneliness, the solitude. And just as I was settling in, the cop walked past with mail. He did this every night, and he never stopped at my door, but on this night he did. He tapped on the side of the door and went, Hey, are uh, you Channel? I leapt out of my bed. Yeah, absolutely, I'm Channel. And he had a stack of mail for me, this high. It was over a hundred pages. It was about 20 different letters all put into one big envelope and mailed to me. You see, my wife had been writing me every single night. I hadn't gotten one letter yet, but she'd been writing me since before I left county jail. She didn't have an address. So whenever I arrived at San Quentin and started writing her, she had to wait until then to send what she had written, and it had just turned into a lot of pages. That night, instead of focusing on the solitude and the quiet, I got to read letters from my wife. It was like a breath of fresh air, maybe even not being in prison for just a little bit of time. San Quentin, Badger section had seemed immediate and pervasive, like it was the entirety of my life. Everything was so important and right then. And getting these letters reminded me that there was this whole wonderful world that wasn't just concrete and steel and metal and stink and anger. I had a wife who loved me, who was thinking about me and writing me, and it took me out of that place. Everything had been bad, and one little detail allowed me to quit focusing on the bad and remember the good. Which is an important lesson. It's easy to be overwhelmed in life. In life, we all face trials. Overwhelming hardships sometimes. But at that moment, whenever you feel like you could break, whenever the hardship may actually be overwhelming and you have no more in you, you remember that there are beautiful, wonderful things in the world outside of hardship. I got that letter from my wife and it was a breath of fresh air. And I don't know what that breath of fresh air is for you at that moment. But I know that if you look for it and you think about it, you can find beauty. You can find that wonderful thing to think about. Because life isn't just overwhelming hardship. It is awe-inspiring beauty that stays with you for your entire life.